So, hello also from mine. Um, I'm Yasmin dolak Struz. I'm expert for the Maurice Godoska Curie Actions. And also online with me is uh, Therese Lindahl, the national contact point for Maurice Godowska Curie Action. And you will hear her during the Q&A session when she will collect and read out your questions. And also, if you prefer to post something in German, she will translate the questions into English. So that's very briefly some information about us. Um, now we want to know a bit more about you and start with our first poll. All right, um, I will um, put the first poll now. Um, you should see it in your field now. Um, so the first question is, how much experience do you have with European programs? Um, none, participation in a Marie Sklodowska Curie proposal or project, or participation in another European proposal or project. Please vote now. All right, I can see 80% have already voted. Um, we will give you a few more seconds. So what do you think, Yasmin? Yeah, just, okay, growing, yeah. So, all right, I'm gonna yeah, close majority it. majority has already voted, yeah, let's close it. Perfect. So, um, okay, so 15% of you has uh, no experience at all. 15% has already participated in a Maurice Kudowski Curie proposal or project. And actually, 69% uh, have uh, participated in another European uh, proposal or project. So actually, um, yeah, already quite a lot is of experience, at least um, in, in, in European programs in general. Okay, perfect. Thanks a lot. Um, What are we going to talk about? And I hope there will be something in for all of these three groups uh, with very little experience and also with uh, quite a bit. <clears throat> so we're going to start with some important concepts and definitions, mainly for those with very little experience. Um, and then we're going to look at the three most important risk or actions for companies. Um, first of all, the individual fellowships where uh, you can get experienced researchers for your organization. Um, research and innovation staff exchange or RISE, where the topic is knowledge transfer through staff exchange. And then finally, the innovative training networks or ITN, um, which are international networks for the training of young researchers. For all of these actions, we are especially going to look at the relevance for companies and and we're going to look at project examples um, from Austrian organizations. After that, we we'll just have a quick glance at um, Maurice Curie Beyond 2020. At the also very interesting program cost, uh, which is not so well known among companies. And then finally, also very important, um, we're going to uh, talk about partner search and support for your uh, project. Okay, so what are um, <clears throat> important concepts in Maurice Kudowska Curie? So the Maurice Kudowska Curie Actions, or MSCA, because it's a very long name, are a part of Horizon 2020, the European Framework Program for Research and Innovation. Horizon 2020 is actually the biggest European research and innovation program ever with the aim to meet common challenges and to strengthen Europe's eco economic competitiveness. Important principles of the MSCA is career development. So it's really about empowering researchers and equipping them with new knowledge and skills. Then there's the mobility of people. So researchers can get funding on the <coughs> on the ground that they move from one country to the other. And also a very important principle is that MSCA is open to all domains of research and innovation. So bottom up. Important also um, 
the strengthening of the cooperation between academia, private companies, research organizations and other players. Um, company participation in, in, in MSCA is actually well established. So MSCA is third place for program participations of Austrian private companies in Horizon 2020 so far. And for Austrian SMEs, actually it's second place for program participations. What it means is that MSCA is the second most important program for Austrian SMEs. In, uh, that means that about 10% uh, of all Austrian SME participations in Horizon 2020 fall into MSCA. <clears throat> so, sorry, um, quite a lot. On the other hand, Still, many companies do not know about MSCA. And so there's uh, several actions, as you will just see um, in a minute, but not all of the actions are well used by companies. So there are still uh, some more potential. And often for companies who are interested, it's still often not easy to find the right networks and consortia really to participate successfully. Okay. So I told you that uh, strengthening the cooperation between different players is important. So who exactly, what's the exact definition of these players? So first of all, there's the academic sector, um, which is public or private higher education establishments awarding academic degrees. So that's the universities. It's also public or private nonprofit research institutes, <clears throat> Um, whose primary mission is to pursue research and uh, international European interest organizations such, such as, for instance, the CERN. Everyone else is counted for the non-academic sector. So um, that's, uh, that includes any <clears throat> soci socio-economic actor not included in the academic sector. So industry, SMEs, civil society organizations and so on. Um, I already mentioned that mobility is a very, very important principle in MSCA. So first of all, there's the geographic mobility, which is usually mandatory. And there is actually a mobility rule, which we're going to look at uh, later a bit more closely. Intersectoral, so researchers moving from the academic to the non-academic sector, a university to a company or a company to a university for instance, um, is depending on the action, optional or sometimes even mandatory. Um, an important word when it comes to the mobility is, is secondment. So secondments are periods of research training with another project participant. So for instance, for a researcher employed at a university, moving to for a certain period of time to a company yeah aim is to further enrich the training experience of a researcher bottom up approach uh, research topics are chosen freely by the applicants that's of course very um, very attractive for the applicants because you can really propose what you're really interested to do okay about geography. So when we talk in Europe for MSCA, that means today 28 uh, European member states uh, or abbreviation MS plus a number of Horizon 2020 associated countries or AC. So that's countries that paid their share into the program and they're just counted um, like the member states. So that's for instance Turkey, Iceland, Norway or Israel. All other countries are called third countries. Because um, from time to time, um, these countries, some countries change their status. It's always good if you plan a project to check. So um, I've included some links here where you can check the, uh, the current list of associated countries, uh, third countries and the funding rules for them. And because there's the tricky issue of the Brexit uh, looming, um, I can recommend you an FFG webinar on the 10th of February. So I think um, last time I checked the registration was not online yet, but you can already really um, 
um, yeah, take down the date. So who can be funded? There's uh, two category, categories for MSCA. First of all, there's the early stage researchers or ESRs. So we have many abbreviations in our program. They have uh, less than four years of research experience and no PhD, uh, typically pre-docs. Typically they have a master degree, but not yet a doctoral degree. Or there's experienced researchers, um, they have a PhD or at least four years of full-time equivalent research experience and um, typically they, they, they would be postdocs. Okay, this is very important for the different actions. What are the actions? I already mentioned that the individual fellowships where it's about research training and career development for individual researchers. Funding um, you can get funding here for experienced researchers only. There's the innovative training networks, networks for research training of early stage researchers. So they can be funded here. And then there's a research and staff innovation, uh, research and innovation staff exchange where um, not the employment uh, is funded, but um, <clears throat> there's a top up for staff exchange of research related staff. So that can be um, experienced or early stage or even technical or administrative staff. Then there's two more actions which are not uh, really relevant for companies, co-fund and European Researchers Night. So I'm not going to mention them anymore um, in this presentation. Okay, then also very interesting for you, of course, what is funded. The funding in Marie Skudowska Curie Action is quite simple if you're used to um, other project types in Horizon 2020, because it's based on unit costs. So uh, these unit costs are multiplied by the number of person month of employment of, for instance, your experienced researcher or your uh, early stage researchers for IF or ITN, or person month of secondments in RISE. Um, these unit costs are, um, are divided into two categories. First of all, there's institutional costs um, with a contribution to project costs. So this is called research, training and networking costs. And there's also a contribution to management and overheads. Then there's the researcher costs. Um, for uh, living and, uh, and mobility of researchers or family uh, for the funded researchers. If they have a family, which means they're married or have uh, children or in RISE costs arising from the mobility of researchers. So this is the top up I already mentioned. And um, these costs, are, as I said, just multiplied by the number of person months. And um, in the, when you get the presentation slides afterwards, uh, we will also include uh, a detailed slide about um, the different amount of allowances and also some uh, project cost examples. Okay, let's start now with the individual fellowships. Basics is that there's an experienced researcher who applies together with the host institu institution, so you, hopefully, for funding. The host organization can be from the academic or the non-academic sector. There is no age limit for the researcher and also no restrictions regarding nationality, with just a few exceptions where um, researchers have to be long-term residents. Mobility, as I said, there's a mobility rule for the geographic mobility uh, in order to make sure researchers really move from one country to the other. And the rule says that researchers may not have resided or carried out their main activity, work or studies, in the country of their host organization for more than 12 months in the three years immediately before the deadline. So you can have spent some time in the country you're moving to, but not too much. So that's what the mobility rule uh, makes sure. 
Optimal now in the project is uh, to have the continents within Europe. Um, this can uh, last up to six months and possibly between sectors, but not necessarily. There's uh, several times, uh, types of fellowships. Um, first of all, there's the European fellowships, where the fellow uh, stays one to two years in a European member state or associated country. There are standard European fellowships, and then there's some special panel for uh, reintegration. So that's for researchers who are uh, currently in a third country and want to return to Europe. Career restart for researchers who had a longer uh, um, career break. And that's the most important uh, for today is the society and enterprise panel. So that's <clears throat> at the moment, there's an extra budget um, reserved for uh, projects with non-academic host organizations, for instance, companies. And the good thing is that um, success rates are much more attractive um, than in the other panels. Um, also, there is a relaxed mobility rule, so it's not as strict as um, the one I presented before. So um, it, uh, they must have uh, worked or resided less than three years out of five before the deadline. So it's a bit uh, less strict. Okay, so um, now I already have the next poll for you. Yes, thank you, Yasmin. I will start the poll for you. Um, so the next question for you to answer is, what is the percentage of individual fellowships submitted for the SNE panel in the 2019 call? Um, about 2% of all submissions, about 15% of all submissions, or about 30% of all submissions? Please vote now. All right, votes are coming in, Yasmin. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We'll just give them a few more seconds to vote. We're about, we already received about half of the votes. What do you think, 10 more seconds? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Seconds. so if you still want to vote, do it now, please. All right, yeah. okay. Okay. I, mm -hmm. All right, I'm gonna close. Yeah, the perfect. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna show you the results. Okay, thank you. So 8% uh, say it's 2% of all submissions. Uh, the majority, 71%, say it's about 15%. And still 21% say it's about a third of all submissions. So um, of uh, companies or other non-academic institutions as host organizations. So the correct answer is, um, it's it's the first one, it's only 2% of all submissions in the last call. And it's really, I mean, I, I can understand why only 8% um, chose this because it's really, really little. And it I think it shows very well that um, the individual fellowships have not arrived yet um, at, at the companies. So I think it's very interesting and maybe we can rise uh, this rate um, for the next call. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, so I'm going to continue with the, with the second type of individual fellowships um, where the fellows can uh, spend one to two years in a third country. Uh, followed by a one-year mandatory return phase in Europe. So, um, for instance, um, <clears throat> an, an, a fellow uh, uh, located in Austria could move to Canada if the mobility rules, rule is uh, fulfilled there and uh, do research for two years there and then come back to, for instance, an Austrian company to have uh, one more year of, of research. Additional secondments in Europe are possible and uh, as I briefly mentioned, the mobility rule um, <clears throat> applies only for the host organization in the third country. Um, I promised you some Austrian success stories for each of the project types. So for IF, for the SME panel, um, we have a few. <laughs> for instance, there's uh, the project Move Again with host organization uh, GTEC, 
we started 2017. And the topic is very exciting. It's about stroke rehabilitation based on a brain uh, computer interface. And uh, here's the fellow uh, Xuren and the website of the project if you want to know more about it. We also have a large company um, having a fellow, the, the project Sapphire by Infineon. Uh, about scalable DSP algorithms. And um, there's the project DexSage uh, by Finio. Started this very uh, recently, started 2019. And this is a study on how everyday experiences contribute to successful aging with the fellow uh, Eva Jaros. And here's also the website. All in all, we have fee four um, uh, projects. So actually, GTEC has another one running right now. So these are our um, success stories. So what are the take-home messages for the fellowships? Um, from the viewpoint of host organization, um, you can get funding for an experienced researcher from abroad and have uh, employment for one to two years in the society and enterprise panel or which is also possible, just host a secondment for uh, three to six months. From the viewpoint of the researchers, uh, it means enhanced career pe perspectives through the fellowship. It's a very prestigious grant with attractive funding, of course, um, if the project is successful. Um, the next deadline for IF is 9th of September this year, so it's really a perfect timing. The call will open in April, then uh, you will have all the documents. And so it's a perfect timing to uh, try to um, find a fellow and to um, work on the application together. Okay, so let's have a look at RISE, uh, Research and Innovation Staff Exchange. RISE is very different actually to the fellowships. So here we have now a joint research project for up to four years. And it's a, it's a collaborative project. So we need at least three legal entities from three different countries. At least two of them must be from member state or associated country. If all three of them are from the same sector, at least one organization has to be from a third country. So the consortia have to be either intersectoral or international or both. Participation of SMEs is seen as a plus. On average, um, there's a three to nine participating organizations in successful projects. The implementation uh, is done through the continents. So, uh, as I mentioned, we have the exchange of research-related staff. Um, this exchange can be between one and 12 months, and experienced early-stage researchers and technical or administrative staff. And on the right-hand side, you see a, a picture uh, a, uh, um, of a project coordinated by an Austrian uh, organization, uh, Kuratorium für Verkehrssicherheit. It's actually already uh, finished the project, but I like the picture so much be because it shows you, so it's just for one work package uh, within two years, the different, um, the different paths for the secondment. So the errors is people being seconded from one place to the other. And so this is only for one work package. So you can see that these projects can get quite complex um, quite quickly but uh, it, worked, it worked really very well for, for this project. Um, for, for the secondments, the top up for traveling and accommodation costs uh, per seconded person month is financed. The salary is not funded. So when you second a researcher to another place in Europe or beyond Europe, um, they have to be uh, still paid by you um, full time actually, but you get some institutional costs for the networking and everything, and this top up um, for, for the costs related to the traveling. And um, yeah, also part of the project is networking. So we'll have uh, consortium meetings, workshops, and so on. Um, there's uh, special rules uh, regarding the staff exchange. So within Europe, it's only between the academic and the non academic sector. So, for instance, not between companies. Staff exchange between uh, Europe and third countries can be within the same sector or between sector. 
and staff exchanges within one country or between third countries are not funded. So um, often if you have an idea and a possible consortium, you really have to just to sit down and, and, and think it through, uh, think it through um, what makes sense and what's actually funded in, 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 your, in your project. Okay, so uh, again, uh, <laughs> I have a question for you. So we have our next poll here. Okay, thank you, Yasmin. We're going to start the poll now. And the question this time is, an Austrian company taking part in a RISE project could second staff members to an SME in Germany, to a Canadian museum, or to a Spanish university? Please note that you can select multiple answers here. All right, I see the votes are already coming in. All right, we're about 40% of the votes now. Okay. All right, a few more seconds to go for you to vote. Okay, I think... Uh, yeah. We can close the poll now, right, Yasmin? Mm -hmm. What do you think? Thank you. Okay, yeah, perfect. Thanks. And here you can see the results. Okay, so 58% say um, <clears throat> you can have a secondment funded from an Austrian company to an SME in Germany. So um, this is not true because it would be an, in the, within the same sector, so the non-academic sector within Europe. So this is the case where it's uh, yeah, you can do it, but you wouldn't get funding for it. 50% say it's possible to have an exchange to a Canadian museum, which is right. The museum would also be most likely um, non-academic sector, but um, <clears throat> uh, it's in Canada, so it's in a third country, so it counts as international uh, exchange and is funded. And 96% uh, said to a Spanish university, which is uh, completely correct, because this is intersectoral. Okay, thank you very much. We have also, uh, of course, uh, Austrian success stories for RISE. Uh, I, I took one example, the RISE project uh, Clover, uh, about environmental mechatronic uh, control systems coordinated by the German uh, Technische Universität Ilmenau. And there's two Austrian beneficiaries, the Graz University of Technology and uh, as company AFA List GmbH. And um, we had uh, um, an interview with Andreas Klug from AFA List uh, about his experiences in RISE. And he sent us a very nice statement uh, about his experience and what went uh, well and what doesn't uh, work so well in the RISE project. And I'm, um, I'm going to include this slide um, in the, for, for the downloads also to have his, uh, his statement. So take home messages for RISE. Well, it means knowledge transfer and new skills for staff within the framework of a joint and bottom-up research project. It's strengthening the international networks and corporations. And so far, uh, we have had very good success rates, about 25%, which is really high, high compared to other Horizon 2020 programs in general. But there is also important issues. So that the uh, personal costs are not funded and that the staff has to remain employed at the sending institution. So the top up is really only for traveling and accommodation costs. Salary is not funded. So I'm repeating this because it's often a problem for companies when they are um, included in a RISE project, but then some, sometimes it even comes as a surprise when they're already in a project. So um, it's good to be really aware of this before. And um, projects are often very ambitious, we've seen regarding a number and duration of secondments. So please plan realistically, because otherwise it's, it's, quite, it's quite exhausting to have the project running then, because then it has to be uh, really uh, carried out as you planned it. Next deadline for RISE is the 28th of April, 2020. 
So um, it would be about time um, if you want to take part in this, but it would be still possible from the time. And now our, our last um, <clears throat> action, the innovative training networks. Here, an international network applies for a joint training or doctoral program for early stage researchers. The involvement of the non-academic sector is vital. Organizations are full partners called beneficiary uh, and employ the early stage researchers or only host secondments or provide trainings, then they are called partner organizations. So that's a kind of lighter uh, way of, of, of taking part in an ITN. Project duration is typically 48 months, uh, full four years, and employment of early stage researchers is possible between three and 36 months. Um, usually they're just employed for a full three years. And the mobility rule applies um, in a strict form uh, at the moment of their recruitment. Uh, secondments are possible. The main activity in ITN is training through individual research projects, so what the ESRs uh, work on for the three years, including a good supervision, so they must not be left alone, that's very important. Then there's also network-wide training activities for the ESRs, such as seminars, workshops, summer schools, and so on, and transferable skills training, so everything that's not strictly related to their research, like project management, IPR, entrepreneurial skills, ethics, and so on. Everything that will help them um, to join the workforce uh, successfully after their PhD. Cooperation and knowledge exchange within networks is important, dissemination, exploitation of results, and also public outreach. Um, we already had the last call for ITN in Horizon 2020. It's going to be continued, but because we don't know exactly um, how the rules will be, I will just present you the, mo the main type so far, the most common type, the European training networks, to illustrate how these networks um, look like. So uh, you have to have a minimum of three beneficiaries from three different European countries, Average size is six to ten beneficiaries, so not so small networks. Each beneficiary employs at least one early stage researcher with a maximum of uh, 540 person month, which means, for instance, 15 early stage researchers employed for three years. Involvement of the non academic sector is essential, enrollment for PhD is expected, and Secondments are possible up to 30%, up to one year, quite long, of the fellowship duration. And important, these rules might change for the next ITN call, but it's going to stay similar, but not exactly like this, probably. Austrian success stories. We have many Austrian companies uh, taking part in ITN. There's also quite a few with multiple ITN participations. For instance, Afo Elis, which all, uh, also uh, were in the RISE project, Keysight Technologies, uh, Roboros Instruments, or RISC Software. So they have really uh, multiple ITN participations, but there's many more actually. I also want to show you the project BioCascades about multi enzyme cascade reactions coordinated by TU Graz with eight academic and five non-academic beneficiary. And I think it's a really nice example because the early stage researchers in BioCascade uh, spent all 18 months doing research in a European biotech company, which, which gives them really a good competitive advantage after their PhD. But it's also great for the biotech companies because they can just employ them afterwards if they want to. Take home messages. So it's a bottom-up research project with collaboration, networking with other European and international organizations. As I said, non-academic organizations can be full, a full member of the consortium and employ ESRs or host secondments or provide trainings as partner organizations. It gives um, <clears throat> access to highly qualified potential employees 
and um, we expect the next deadline in the new framework program in the first half of 2021. And um, one last poll for you about the ITNs. Yes, Yasmin, I will start the last poll for our participants today. So the last question is, to profit from getting in contact with the young researchers trained in an ITN, partner organizations have to host all of them for a second month, can supervise ESRs, or can participate in project meetings and in the management. Um, you can also uh, choose several answers here as well, like the last question we um, posed for you. So, okay. Votes are coming in slowly, but surely. Okay. A few more seconds for you to vote. A last chance to participate. Okay. We're about 60% of all. Mm -hmm have voted. What do you think, Yasmin? A few more seconds yeah. or would you like okay, to close? Yeah. Okay, okay, perfect. I'm going to close and I'm going to show you the results. Yeah, so 12% uh, say uh, um, companies have to host all of the ESRs for a secondment. So this is not correct because all you don't have to take all of them. It's possible, but usually it doesn't make sense. You can host some of them where the research topic fits. 80% um, are right, um, they can co-supervise ESRs and 92% also voted correctly. Um, companies can uh, participate in project meetings and also in the management boards of the project um, and really to take part here. Okay, thank you very much. Um, just quick glance at uh, MCA in Horizon Europe, the next framework uh, program for research and innovation. All in all, we expect continuity for MSCA and also the budget will probably stay about the same. There are some possible changes, such as the action will be named differently. Um, there will be a fine tuning of rules, especially for RISE, probably a bit simpler, hopefully. And also to raise um, success rates, especially for ITN, there might be some restrictions on, on resubmissions. Um, but all in all, it's really continuity what we expect. About partner search, um, first of all, your own network are of course the best um, to ask around if there's projects planned and so on. But in addition, there's a partner search tool of the European Commission where you can see uh, which organizations have taken part in, in different projects. And also on every core website of the Commission. So for instance, here I included the link of the RISE call, the current one. Uh, you can also sign up here and present your organization and ask for, um, for possible um, collaboration. Um, very important, I think, is the EURACCESS network, which supports uh, mobile researcher. Um, so, for instance, if you want to plan an IF, you can post a job, uh, a hosting offer there. You just have to register. Um, so, this is really used a lot by young researchers. And then there's also the Net for Mobility Plus project, uh, an uh, NCP project, where you can post an expression of interest to take part. Plus, uh, we're going to send you, for those who, who, who agreed uh, to this, we're going to send you the list of participants um, for, this, um, for, for this webinar. So maybe there's also the one, one or another contact um, yeah, you, you can um, yeah, establish. Okay, just very brief cost, cooperation, science and technology. Another bottom-up program which uh, gives support for interdisciplinary and intersectoral networks and is often an entry point for European research cooperation. Um, supported by my uh, colleague Nicole Schmidt here at FFG and so it's really worth uh, looking at the website and we have also a, um, a joint info sheet in German however uh, cost and MSCA especially for companies uh, what's in it uh, for you. 
MSDA supportive FHGs, that's my two colleagues and me, Therese Lindahl, Lil Reif and me. And uh, you can send us an email or call us and definitely have a look at our website and the info sheets and all the information. Okay, so that was all the information I wanted to give you. And um, now we can continue the, to the Q&A session. So I have yes. the slides here. Thank you very much for your presentation, Yasmin. Um, as we previously mentioned, the Q&A session will not be recorded. 